Hey everyone, this week in Computer Science 340, we're gonna be talking about recursion. Now, the reason for this is because recursion is going to be really important for some of the algorithms and data structures we're gonna look at next. Some of our sorting and searching algorithms are gonna rely on recursion. And also when we get to binary search trees, those are like heavily recursive data structures. Almost all the stuff we do with them is gonna be best done with recursion. Now you probably saw recursion at least a little bit in computer science 220, but I find that some students struggle to get used to thinking recursively and dealing with recursion. So we're gonna be looking at it this week. In this video, we're gonna talk about what recursion is and how it works and sort of the mechanics of it. And then the next two sections of this week are going to be just examples of recursive algorithms and doing things recursively. So let's go ahead and get started with this. All right, we're gonna start our discussion of recursion by looking at an example to begin with. And that example is the computation of factorials. Now, if you remember, the factorial of a number is defined like this, all of the numbers starting at that number down to one times together, right? So we can say, for example, that like four factorial is equal to four times three times two times one, and you times them all together like this. Now there's sort of like two ways of looking at the factorial. The first way we're gonna talk about is doing it iteratively, which means with a loop. So this definition that I put here of the factorial is sort of like an iterative solution. It says that you start with x and then you times in x minus one and then x minus two and you keep going looping through it until you get to two and then to one. So we can come up with some sort of like loop based code for this and come up with an algorithm like, you know, into the factorial of the number x that we're taking in. And we can say that int, uh, I guess we'll call it product, starts off equal to x. There's different ways we could write it. And then we can say for all the numbers, i equals x minus one, because we need to go on to this number here next then while x is greater than or equal to one, x minus minus, sort of looping through all the numbers. And each time through, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say that the product is equal to the product times this number i that we're giving in, and then we'll return that as the final value. So this is taking this sort of like loop based idea of looking at this definition of X factorial and converting it to code. We're basically doing the same thing. We're starting at X and we're looping through all of these other numbers with this for loop until we get down to one. So this is probably the way of thinking about the factorial program that makes the most sense. This is what most of you would do or you'd use a while loop instead of a for loop or something like that, but you'd use some kind of looping thing where you start at the beginning and go through the rest of the numbers one by one until you get to the end. But today we're talking about recursion. And so I thought I'd start by looking at another way of thinking about the factorial program altogether. And recursion versus iteration isn't just a programming thing. It's like a mathematical thing as well. And so here is an alternative way of looking at the definition of a factorial. This is another mathematical definition for the same thing. Here we have a recursive definition and it's recursive because in defining what this symbol means, we have used this symbol itself on the right hand side. So in defining what a factorial is, we've defined it in terms of another factorial. And that seems like a circular definition. Like if you are asked the definition of a word and the definition uses that word, it's probably not gonna be super helpful. But the trick with recursion is that in defining something in terms of itself, you actually like whittle it down closer to something that doesn't have a recursive part of it. And that's where this base case comes in, which is the zero factorial is equal to one bit. And so let's see what happens if we go through a definition of this, an expansion of it, I should say. We can do the four factorial example again. Well, based on our definition, four factorial is equal to four times by x minus one, which is three factorial. So we've expanded it this one time now, and now we have four factorial is equal to four times three factorial. But that doesn't really help us all the way yet because we still have this three factorial in place. And so what we need to do is we need to expand again 
and use this recursive rule again to plug in 3 for x and see what 3 factorial is equal to. Well, that's 3 times 3 minus 1, 2 factorial, which gives us here. And now, as you might imagine, we're just going to keep going and we're going to say 2 factorial. We have to figure out what that is by plugging the 2 into this definition, which gives us 2 times 1 factorial. And if we carry on, we're going to get 1 times 0 factorial. And now we don't go ahead and substitute the 0 in for x here. Now the recursion bottoms out is, is how we would phrase it. And we would hit the base case and use the simple definition here instead of the recursive definition. And we just have like hard coded in here that 0 factorial is equal to 1. So then we would go ahead and make that substitution and put a 1 in here and then times all of these together to get the final answer, which by the way is 24. So recursion isn't just a programming thing, it's like a way of looking at problems essentially. It can be used in, in just plain mathematics as well. And so we can go ahead and translate this sort of recursive mathematical definition of factorial into code pretty easily. It would look something like this. We'd say int fact of int x, just like before. And now, though, we would have a little if-else statement because we need to see which of these two cases are we doing. Are we doing the recursive case here, or are we doing this base case here? So I'd say something like, if x is equal to 0, then we do our base case, and we should just return 1 from this method. Otherwise, we're going to do the recursive case, and I'm going to say we return x times by the factorial of x minus 1. So pretty much exactly the same as this, except we're translating it into Java code. And now what makes this a recursive method, of course, is that in defining the fact method, we call the fact method itself inside of its own method definition. That's what makes it recursion. So let's go ahead and look at the code for this and see how this actually works. So here is the same method that we just talked about inside of a .java file. And inside of main, we just call this with the numbers 1 through 10 to print out the first 10 factorials. So let's compile and run it first of all, and then we'll sort of talk about how it is working. So we get the answers. So like I said, let's, let's go back and, and talk about how this is actually working in terms of the actual computer, like what's happening. So earlier on in the semester, we talked about the stack and how the stack is used to hold all of the parameters and local variables of a method. Well, the stack is super important for recursion to work. In fact, if you don't have a stack, you can't have recursion. And in fact, some really early programming languages, like the first versions of Fortran from the 50s, didn't have a stack, and so you couldn't write recursive functions in Fortran in the early days. And this was, of course, like a huge flaw in these programming languages. And so nowadays, every modern language has a stack and so supports recursion. So it's super important. You have to have a stack, otherwise you can't have recursion. And the reason why is because this code relies on there being not just one copy of the variable x, but as many copies of x as there are calls to the fact method. So let's see how that works. Inside of main, we go ahead and have a stack frame for main, and that would store all the stuff that main has. Main didn't really have too many variables. It mostly just called upon other methods to do stuff. So the next thing that happens is we call the fact method with a parameter for x. So this is the fact method. And let's say for the first version of this, we have 4 again. We're trying to calculate the factorial of the number 4. Well, then what happens is we go into the code for the fact method, check if x is equal to 0, and it's not. Then we go ahead and do this expression here, this x times fact of x minus 1. And of course, before it can do the multiplication, it has to figure out what both sides are equal to. We know what x is equal to, but we don't know what the fact of x minus 1 is equal to. So to figure that out, it has to call the fact method. And so that's what it does. It calls the fact method, and it then pushes another stack frame for fact. So whenever you have a recursive call, it pushes a new stack frame for each version of it. And now this stack frame also has a variable x inside of it, 
but its one has a different value. Now the x inside of here is going to be equal to 3, one less than the original one. Now we go back to the top of the fact method. We sort of like pause this one. Whenever you call a method, you pause the method you're currently in, regardless of if that's the same method like this or a totally separate method. So this one is like paused right here. It's sort of in status waiting for the other one to return. And then we jump to the top of the fact method again. We'll check if this x is equal to zero and it's not. So we go ahead and again, need to figure out what x is and what fact of x minus one is so we can do this multiplication. And to do that, we call the fact method again, this time with x is equal to two on the stack. So now there's three copies of the fact method on the stack, three different stack frames for it. Well, as you can probably guess, we're gonna now pause this copy of the fact method and go back to the top again with x is equal to two. We're then going to check if that's equal to zero, which it's of course not. So we jump into a new call to fact with x is equal to one as the parameter that's on the stack frame. Then we do the same thing one last time. We call ourselves again with x is equal to zero inside of the fact method. Then we go here at the top of this method and we check if x is equal to zero and it in fact is. And so then we're going to pop this stack frame off of the stack and jump back here to where we left off in this version of the fact method where x was equal to one. So we would then see that this returned zero, no, I'm sorry, it returned one as, as the return value for fact of zero. And so then we have one times this x, which is equal to one. So this one returned one. And now this one's gonna return one as well. So let me clean this up real quick. All right, so now we're in this copy of the fact method where x was equal to one. We got our answer for the fact of zero, it being one. Now we times the one and the one together to get the value of one. And then this is going to return one. Hope you're with me so far. Then what happens is this is popped off of the stack, of course, right here. And we return the one back into this version of the method. All right, then we go back here in the version of fact where x was equal to two. The fact of one that we calculated here returned us a one. And then we have our x is equal to two. We times those together to get the value two. And then we're going to return that back into this original, into this previous method. So this one is gonna return a two back into the version of fact here. And then this one gets popped off the stack. Then we go back into the version of fact where x was equal to three. We figured out that the fact of two was equal to two, and now we times the three by the two in order to get a value of six. We then return the six from this method down into the method that called us, which is the other version of fact. Then this gets popped off the stack when this version of fact returns, so it looks like this. Now we go ahead and we have figured out in this original version of fact, the very first one, where we pause to figure out what fact of three was equal to, we now have our answer. The fact of three is equal to six. We have our version of x, which is equal to four. We times those two things together to get 24, and then we'll return that back into main here. And then whatever main was doing by calling the fact of four, wherever that was, it will now be replaced with the value 24, and we've gotten the answer by doing this recursive process. So hopefully that makes sense. That's how recursion works. It works by maintaining the stack and keeping track of all of the different values of the parameters that are passed in. So what happens if we didn't have this base case in here? What if we just went ahead and said, return x times fact of x minus one? Well, we would get this scenario where we call it with x equals three, which would call it with x equals two, and then it would call it with x equals one and x equals zero. And last time it bottomed out at this point and it just sort of like short circuited the recursion and just returned one directly. Now that wouldn't happen. It would go ahead and pass in negative one and then negative two and then so on and so on and so forth. Let's see what happens if we actually run the program with that in place. Well, it's easy to do. I will just comment out these lines of code 
that did the if else statement, and now the method just returns x times fact of x minus 1 directly. Let's recompile it and rerun it and see what happens. We get this mess. <laughs> we scroll up. I can't even hardly scroll up that far. Okay, so we have this. We have exception in thread main, java.lang.stack overflow error. Now the name Stack Overflow might seem familiar to you from a popular programming website, but before it was a website, it was this error message, this situation when we have overflowed our stack. And if you see on our stack, <laughs> the stack trace that this exception produces just lines and lines and lines and lines of fact dot fact. We're in the same method over and over and over again on line eight. So that's what happens when we have an infinitely recursive method like this. It's different than an infinite loop. With an infinite loop, your program will just hang forever. With an infinite recursion like this, you will eventually run out of stack space because the stack is only so big. You can't just push stack frames on it forever without running out of memory space. And so at some point you're going to run out of stack space, get this stack overflow error, and then the program is going to stop you. So there's two rules for having recursion and having it work. The first one is you have to have a base case at least. Sometimes you'll actually have multiple base cases, but you need at least one base case. And the base case, of course, is a situation where the recursive method does not call itself recursively, but instead just bottoms out and returns like an actual value. The second rule of having recursion is that you have to approach the base case. Just having the base case isn't enough. You have to actually get closer to it. So if we look at our factorial method the right way again, which is here, we'll see that both cases, both of these rules are being followed. We have the base case. When x is equal to zero, we just return one directly. We don't recurse in this situation. And the other one is being followed as well because each time we call fact, we call it with one less than we currently have. So we are approaching x equals zero. If I did something like this and said, call fact with x plus one, then even though we have a base case, we're never actually going to reach it because we're not getting closer to it. The way that recursion should work oops, is it should, it should sort of like break off the problem chunk by chunk. And as you go breaking off chunks, you need to hit the base case eventually to finish up the process. So hopefully that makes sense. The next two videos this week are going to go through some examples of coming up with recursive methods to solve different problems. The trick with recursion sort of is like coming up with the recursive idea, the key idea of how do you break the problem into a smaller subproblem. Some of the examples we'll look at are things that you would normally do with a loop in Java, but it's helpful to think about how you can approach the same problems you're used to using loops to solve with recursion instead. But some of the problems will be things that are actually more naturally solved with recursion. The cool thing about recursion is it gives you sort of like a new lens through which to view problems. And sometimes when you look through that lens, the problem gets a lot simpler. We'll see a couple problems like this where doing the same thing with a loop would be harder than it would with recursion. So let's go ahead and move on to that.